Hi, welcome to the first lecture of Chem 1010, um, summer 2017. And today, in this lecture, we're going to be covering what I like to call the historical perspective of matter from chapter 2, and, and that is really what matter was thought of uh, around the 1800s. And, and then we're going to delve into the topic of atomic structure, and that is what we understand matter to be today. Before we start talking about the any actual subject matter, uh, there's a few things I wanted to mention. Uh, the first is that lectures 1, 7, and 9 uh, this year uh, are going to be recorded this year. Um, all the other lectures are from were recorded from 2014. So anything in those lectures that talks about the schedule of the class, uh, test dates, that sort of thing, you can disregard. Right? And if you ever have questions about the schedule, please refer back to the syllabus or ask me in, in class. Um, because again, those most of the lectures that you're going to see in the, from this class are three years old, right? The subject matter is not going to change, but the, the class schedule and the order of some things might change. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention is some tips for doing problem sets. All right. And you really want to do these problem sets. It, it might seem sort of obvious, but you want to do these problem sets with uh, a book, right? You, you would be surprised with how many students I see in the fall classes that, you know, ask me for help with a problem on their problem set, and then they, they really don't know how to, how to start a problem, and it's a problem that's exactly the same from a book example. So whether you have a hard copy of the book or just the ebook open in another window, it's really helpful to have the book open when you're doing these problems because a lot of them in the problem sets are the same as example problems from the book. Right? Uh, the other thing that I really think is important is to submit your problem set after every correct answer you get. And, and why do you need to do this? Well, it's because people this is another very common problem. They'll do most of the assignment and then they'll say, okay, I'll finish it. I'll finish the rest later. And then they forget to finish it. And if they submit after the deadline, then they get points taken off, right? Even if they've done, you know, 80% of the problem set correctly on time, they're still going to get docked 20% per day for that. So what I would recommend to do is submit after every correct answer you get. That way you have a, a save point. And you don't have to worry about only being able to submit your problem set once. You can submit, reopen the assignment, and start right where you left off. So you don't have to enter in all the correct answers that you got. Again, they'll be saved. Okay, And you can submit as many times as you want. So so don't don't worry about that. And then the final thing I'll say is that you should be writing down each question on paper and do your work on paper. All right, and that way you can see any math mistakes you make and you can also use these as notes um, for studying. Okay, um, And it's also easier when you can't get something right if you just uh, send me a picture of, of that, that problem or in our case in the summer we'll be working together on these problem sets in class, um, I can. it's really easy for me to see if you made a, a math mistake. Okay. Right. Before we start chapter two material, I wanted to say something about the mole. And I'm sure most of you, if you've had chemistry before, will know uh, what the mole is. It's the amount of something that equals the number of atoms that are in uh, a 12 gram sample of carbon 12 and right and it's this number which we call Avogadro's number so a mole and Avogadro's number is really the same same thing right and 
these uh, a mole can be described it, it can be used to describe anything right and typically in this class we use it to describe atoms or molecules but it can really be used to describe anything you want it's sort of a term like a dozen right it just tells you that it's this number which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd it's that number of something right and why I bring this up now is we a couple years ago we made a, a change in the order of material uh, that's covered in this class and technically we're not going to know quote unquote know what a mole is until chapter 3 material is covered and that's not uh, until uh, the second week of the, the class but we're gonna be doing uh, material from chapters 7, 8, 9 uh, in the book and you might see some problems that are in terms of moles where moles factor in uh, and typically the, the example I can think of is in chapter 7 you'll have uh, units of kilojoules per mole alright and that's what it, this is the per mole is referring to so even though we're not covering what a mole is technically until chapter 3 there's still a chance that you might see this uh, on the problem set and on the exam I, I'll try to try to keep it so you don't need to know what a mole is before we actually cover it in chapter 3 right but on the problem sets uh, all all bets are off on that okay this is the material we're going to be covering in chapter 2 you'll notice we're not covering sections 7 through 9 um, those are sort of being left out right so let's first define some components of matter right on this explanation of what matter is we need to define um, some components of matter and there are four definitions we'll, we'll cover right one is an element I'm sure you're probably familiar with what that means um, basically it's the simplest type of substance uh, it has unique physical and chemical properties an element consists of only one type of atom um, that that term atom really wasn't known at, at first and back in the, the 1800s um, but people really understood what an element was there was the they couldn't break it down any further and all elements seem to have the same physical and chemical properties the other term is molecule and what a molecule is it's a structure that consists of two or more atoms chemically bound together and because they're chemically bound together they stick together they behave as an independent unit right? and some elements actually occur naturally as molecules not all molecules are elements but some elements can be molecules and the examples the easiest ones are hydrogen gas H2 so hydrogen in its natural form uh, is a, a, a molecule a diet what we would call a, a homo dimer a di atomic molecule uh, N2 and O2 are also in their natural form molecules and those are easy to remember because they're the gases of the atmosphere the halogens and those are in column or group 7a those are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those are also diatomic molecules in their natural form. And then some that you might not know, phosphorus, sulfur, and selenium are also in their natural form molecules. Right. Okay, a couple other definitions of, of matter. A compound, that's a substance that's composed of two or more elements that are chemically combined so a compound is a molecule but it has more than one element in it okay. and then finally a mixture right. and a mixture is 
something that is a group of two or more elements or compounds that are physically intermingled. Right. So if we look at an example of, of elements and uh, compounds. So sodium and chlorine, those are both elements, and their physical properties are listed. Right. So sodium, we can see that it has a, a rather high melting point, high boiling point. It's a naturally sort of a silvery soft metal at room temperature. Behavior in water, it, it reacts very explosively. Right. Chlorine, chlorine is a gas at room temperature. And what that means is it has a very low melting point and a very low boiling point. Uh, color, it's a yellowish green sort of a color. And behavior in water, it sort of dissolves slightly. Right. When we combine sodium and chlorine into the compound sodium chloride, you can see that the physical properties change drastically. They're, they're much different than the, the physical properties of either of the elements. Um, the melting point very, very high, and the boiling point um, much higher still. What, what does it look like at room temperature? Well, it's a colorless or, or white crystal and its behavior in water, it dissolves freely. All right, so sodium, uh, very sort of reactive in water, explosive, even dangerous. Uh, chlorine gas, very, very toxic, actually used as a, a chemical weapon in the First World War, so very dangerous. But when you combine them together, we get sodium chloride or table salt, something that is, is not very dangerous um, in limited quantities uh, that we ingest. So you can see that the physical properties of a compound are much different than the elements that make it up. Right, so let's try a, a practice problem. And I, this one's uh, pretty easy. Uh, you might not need to, but I would suggest that uh, on other practice problems, you pause the lecture and sort of try to work through them for a, a couple minutes. Uh, it, it is what I would recommend doing, but this one you might not need to. Right? So the following scenes represent an atomic scale view of three samples of matter. Describe each sample as an, either an element, a compound, or a mixture. Right, so for, let's try the simplest one. The simplest thing to pick out would be an element because it's um, the, the simplest form of matter, the most purest form of matter. Right? So which one of these depicts an element? Well, that would be B. Right? We have these spheres are one atom of a particular element, and they're not bonded to anything else. And it's not mixed with anything else. Right? So B would be an element. Right. What about a compound? Right. Remember what a compound is. It's a, a substance, a molecule that has different atoms in it that are chemically bonded together. Right. And so the, the, the picture that depicts a compound would be C. Right. There are two different types of atoms that are in those molecules, thus making them a compound. Uh, and finally, A represents a mixture. You can see that there's this compound uh, with the yellow and red spheres. And then we also have some diatomic molecules, the green and the purple. And so all of those different molecules are mixed together. So that would be a mixture. So now that we have these definitions um, listed out, let's talk about how these components of matter were, were first viewed. Right? And the way we're going to start this talk is using the law of conservation of mass. Right? And this really started, if you can believe it or not, back 500, 400 BC from in the ancient Greeks. And they had this idea, um, some Greek philosophers had this idea that nothing comes from nothing. 
So what exists now has always existed, right? No new matter can come into existence. And today we, we basically know that as, as really true. Um, it's a little bit tricky when you throw in relativity and the, the, the idea that energy and mass can be converted from one, and one to another, but typically in our everyday experience, mass is conserved, right? So why was this, uh, for lack of a better word, forgotten? Right? At least in Western tradition, it, it was forgotten for thousands of years. Well, it's because there was very confusing observations. And the, the easiest example of that is to look at wood burning, right? If you think mass is conserved, well, if you throw a piece of wood on a fire, it, it'll eventually disappear, right? So uh, this idea of mass being conserved was really um, hard to test without the right equipment. And that was until uh, this, really the first scientist, the first chemist, um, not, not the first scientist, the first chemist came along, Antoine Lavoisier. And he explained combustion. And he did it using very rep reproducible measurements in a very quantitative fashion. And he had um, this sort of apparatus that he used. And he burnt things like wood, um, some other things as well, but let's use wood as an example, to ashes. And he captured the gas that was released from that as well. And so when he weighed the ashes and the gas, he found out that the mass was actually being conserved, right? And before this, the I mean, today we can take this for granted because we know combustion is something combining with oxygen um, and, and being converted to an oxide. But before Antoine Lavoisier, there was this term called uh, flostagon, and people thought things that burned contained flostagon, and that's what, what, what basically made them turn into nothing when they burned is, is this magical substance called flostagon, which he he disproved. And here's a, a figure from your book, and this conservation of mass really applies to anything, not just burning something. The example they give is a solution of lead nitrate and a solution of sodium chromate. When they mix, you can see that they, they're forming this precipitate. And when they do that, the mass before the reaction is equal to the mass after the reaction. So the total mass of substances do not change during a chemical reaction. That's really the, the important um, thing to note. Right. So the total mass of substances present, present do not change during a chemical reaction. So if we have a reaction, reactant one and reactant two, we can add up their total mass when they react to make a product, that product is going to have the same total mass as the reactants. In an example, calcium oxide plus calcium dioxide, excuse me, calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide goes to calcium carbonate. Now, this is the balanced chemical equation for that reaction. And we'll, we'll talk about balancing chemical equations uh, at a later in a later lecture so don't worry too much about that now but what you'll notice is you have one molecule of calcium oxide one molecule of carbon dioxide they can form and make one molecule of carbon carb calcium carbonate okay so the number of molecules is not conserved but the number of atoms of each element is conserved so the total mass is going to be conserved right and that's an important distinction to note mass is conserved number of molecules isn't right? and if we look at just give these arbitrary masses 
right? If we had 56 grams of calcium oxide and 44 grams of carbon dioxide, we're going to get 100 grams of calcium carbonate being produced, right? The masses is, are conserved. So let's try a, a fairly simplified mass balance practice problem. Okay, so if we have 100 kilograms per minute going into this box, and this is a typical way of showing like a chemical reactor um, in a chemical engineering class, right? This isn't an engineering class, but this is a, a simplified example that we can use. Right? If we have 100 kilograms going into this black box reactor, 20 kilograms per minute of that is sodium hydroxide, 80 kilograms per minute is water, H2O, then we have two outlets. Okay, One outlet is at 40 kilograms per minute. The other outlet is what this, this M naught star. So how, much, how many kilograms per minute is, are, is coming out of this second stream? Let me switch to my pen. All right. So we can just call this stream one up here and stream two down here at the bottom. All right. So how do we find out how much is coming out of, of the stream two? Well, if we have 100 kilograms per minute going in and 40 kilograms per minute coming out of one, stream two has to be 100 minus 40, or 60 kilograms per minute. Okay, so simple mass balances, right? Because mass is conserved, and you notice in this example it's simplified because there's no chemical reactions taking place. It, and thus, this is really just like a, a simple logical test. Right. The other things we can find out are these um, amounts of sodium hydroxide and water. So for M3, it, the amount of H2O coming out in stream one, that would just be 40 minus five, 40 kilograms a minute total, minus five kilograms per minute sodium hydroxide. The remainder would be 35 kilograms per minute of water. Oops. Uh, and then if we look at M1 and M2, if you're interested um, how to how to find these, uh, M2 is going to be 80 kilograms per minute. That's from the total amount of water coming in, minus 35 kilograms per minute. That's the amount going out in stream one, and that's going to equal 45 kilograms per minute. And if 45 kilograms per minute is the amount of water, and we have 60 kilograms per minute total coming out at stream two, M1 is gonna be 60 minus 45, or 15 kilograms per minute. Okay. Right. These, those types of questions get much harder, and these are it's sort of a, a class you would take in, in chemical engineering, one of the, the beginning classes of chemical and engineering, mass and energy balances, but um, this is just an example of that. Uh, I want to mention now that in, in my lectures, if there's a, some material you really don't need to know for the class, it's just something I'm including for your information, for your benefit. I will have this green FYI box up on there. And that means you don't need to, to memorize it or know it for an exam. Okay. So the first law, uh, law of mass conservation. The second law we're going to talk about is the law of definite or constant composition. And that means that if if a compound is found on one place on Earth and another place on Earth, if it's the same compound, it's going to have the same composition, the same elemental composition, right? So the figure in your book, calcium carbonate, 
whether it's in a statue or um, coral reef, it's going to have the same mass percent calcium, mass percent of carbon, and mass percent of oxygen. Uh, another example of something that has calcium carbonate in it is uh, Mount Rushmore. Right? So if we analyze a sample of calcium carbonate, a uh, 20 gram sample, 8 grams are calcium, 2.4 grams are carbon, and 9.6 grams are oxygen. And we can find a mass fraction of that, right, just by dividing the mass of an element in the compound divided by the total mass of the compound and get a mass fraction, right, 0.4 calcium, 0.12 carbon, 0.48 oxygen. Notice they'll add up to one. The other way we can express this is by uh, percentages, mass percentages. And that's really just the mass fraction multiplied by 100. Right, so those are three ways we can, we can express the amount uh, of a particular element in a compound. Right, so let's try a practice problem uh, using, using uh, this idea. Right? Analysis of an 84.2 gram sample of the compound known as pitch blend shows that it's composed of 71.4 grams of uranium. Oxygen is the only other element. How many grams of uranium can be obtained from 102 kilograms of pitch blend? Okay, and then just remember that a kilogram is a thousand grams. That's really the only other information we need in this, this question. Okay, so if 71.4 grams of uranium can be obtained by processing 84.2 grams of pitch blend. The mass fraction of uranium in pitch blend is 0 0.848. Okay. Other way to say that would be uranium is 84.8% uh, mass percent of pitch blend. Right. So now we use that mass fraction and we multiply that by our 102 kilograms of pitch blend. Okay, so if we had uh, really, uh, if we look at our dimensional analysis, the way to think of this would be uh, 71.4 grams of uranium, sorry for my writing, divided by 84.2 grams of pitch blend gives us 0.848 grams of uranium per gram of pitch blend. Right. So if we have 102 kilograms of pitch blend, we multiply that by 0.848 and we get 86.5 kilograms of uranium. Right. And the, the question is asking specifically for grams, so we have to convert kilograms to grams. Right. So there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. Kilograms cancel. And our number is 86.5 times 10 to the third, or 8.65 times 10 to the fourth grams of uranium. The third um, law that we're going to talk about is the law of multiple proportions. Right? And this law really states that elements 
react together in whole number increments. Okay, so if you have elements A and B that are coming together to form compounds, one compound, if you just keep the, the ratio of A constant and look at the, the number of Bs, um, that number of Bs is going to be in different whole number um, increments. So the example we're going to use is carbon oxides. There's um, the first carbon oxide. We, you can think of carbon being element A and oxygen being element B. Right. So in the first carbon oxide, it's 57.1% oxygen, 42.9% carbon. The second carbon oxide is 72.7% oxygen and 27.3% carbon. Those are mass percentages. Right. Now, if you look at, um, if you if you do the math in, in keep carbon constant, you would note that the first oxide is carbon monoxide. It's a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon and oxygen. And the second oxide is carbon dioxide. Right. So how, how do you figure that out? Well, the easiest way to do that is to assume that you have 100 grams of each compound. So those mass percentages basically just become the number of grams of each element in your compound, right? So if the first one you have uh, 57.1 grams of oxygen, and in the second, uh, in the second compound you'd have 72.7 grams of oxygen, and, and the same with carbon, right? So then you divide the grams of oxygen by the grams of carbon and it gives you a ratio, right? So for the, the first one, it's 1.33. The second oxide, that'd be 2.66, those ratios. If you can pair those ratios, divide those ratios now, you'd notice that it's a two to one ratio. And that's what you get. You get, um, there are two oxygens in carbon oxide the second carbon oxide we looked at, and there's one oxygen in the first carbon oxide we looked at, right? And so that, in a, in a nutshell, is the law of um, multiple proportions. So all these laws, all these laws of the composition of matter um, were, were developed in, then they were used by, uh, this guy John Dalton and just a, a little he came up with the the atomic theory for matter um, just a little bit about him he actually began keeping meteorological data uh, at when he was 21 years old and so he did that every day for 57 years right so he was sort of an, an armchair weatherman if you will right kind of interesting and the other thing that he did um, was actually work on color blindness, right? and that's why sometimes color blindness is referred to as Daltonism. Right? Okay, but in our class, what we're concerned with uh, the work of Dalton would be atomic theory, and he took all these laws together and came up with an explanation for them. Right, those laws were based on observations. Nobody really had a theory to explain it, and that's when where Dalton came in. Right? And just as an aside, this atomic theory, much like the con the law of conservation of mass, was uh, the was first developed in ancient Greece. Atomic theory was actually first developed in ancient Greece, and that was by Democritus of Abdera. He came up with this a similar idea of uh, matter being composed of atoms, and he actually coined the term atoms, and that was in 400 BC. Right, so that's just another example of how sometimes knowledge gets lost. So in Dalton's atomic theory, Dalton had uh, a number of postulates, four postulates. One 
all matter consists of atoms and they're tiny indivis indivisible particles of an element that cannot be created or destroyed. Two, atoms of one element cannot be converted into atoms of another element. Right. And so we know, we know these, we take these as truths nowadays, right? And we know that um, the second postulate is um, true unless we're talking about a nuclear reaction, which you'll cover nuclear chemistry um, if you take the second quarter of this. But um, barring a nuclear reaction, atoms of one element cannot be converted into atoms of another element. The third postulate, atoms of an element are identical in mass and other properties, and they're different from atoms of any other element, right? So elements are all unique, but atoms of the same element are identical. And then finally, his fourth postulate, compounds result from the chemical combination of a specific ratio of atoms of different elements. So let's look at the law of mass conservation and how Dalton's atomic theory explained it. Right, first, atoms cannot be created or destroyed. That was postulate one. Uh, second postulate, atoms can't be converted into other types of atoms. And since every atom has a fixed mass, that would be postulate three. During a chemical reaction, the same atoms are going to be present um, but they're going to be in different combinations before and after. But because all the same atoms, same number of atoms are present, there's not going to be a mass change, no overall mass change. So that's how Dalton's atomic theory explained the law of mass conservation. Right, let's look at the second uh, mass law, the law of definite composition. So each atom has a specific mass, that's postulate three from, from the atomic theory. Atoms are combined in compounds in specific ratios. That would be postulate four. Right. Well, if you have atoms being combined in specific ratios and each atom has a specific mass, the compounds that ensue are always gonna have the same mass. So it doesn't matter whether you look at limestone or from the U.S. or limestone from uh, another part of the world. It's going to have the same mass, and it's going to have the same mass composition. Right. Uh, and finally, the law of multiple proportions. Atoms of an element have the same mass. That's postulate three. Atoms are indivisible, postulate one. When different numbers of atoms of elements combine, they must do so in ratios of small whole numbers. Okay, And that was the law of multiple proportions. Right, You never find a compound that has one and a half carbons for every um, one uh, oxygen. Right, They have to combine in, in small whole numbers. Right, and that's the, our example of, of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Right? They're combining in whole number proportions. But you can have the same elements combine in different proportions. Right? So one to one carbon to oxygen ratio in the first oxide and a two to one oxygen to carbon ratio in the second. Let's try a practice problem, trying to visualize some of these mass laws. It, the following represents atomic scale view of a chemical reaction. We have a purple element and a green element reacting to form a compound. Right? So which of the mass laws are illustrated? Right, well, if you count, there are seven purple atoms and nine green atoms on the reactant side. When we go to the products, we still have 
the seven purple atoms and the nine green atoms. So the law of mass conservation, right? The mass is being conserved. The law of definite composition also applies because the compound that's being formed, if you look at these um, four compound molecules that are formed, we have two green atoms and one purple atom in that compound, and it's the same for all of them. So that would be an example of the law of definite composition. The law of multiple proportions is not illustrated here because, again, all of these have the same um, ratio of green to purple. Okay? And there, there isn't another compound that is being formed. All right, so only the first two are being illustrated. All right. So if we look at a timeline for this, Antoine Lavoisier came up with the, his idea of mass conservation around 1750. And Dalton's atomic theory was approximately 50 years later, around 1800. Right. But then the question was asked pretty much right after Dalton's atomic theory, what are these atoms made of? And for scientists to get an answer to that, you really had to wait a hundred years. And why, why such a long wait? Well, technology had to advance enough to answer this question. So much the same reason why mass conservation wasn't seen until 1750 with Lavoisier, nobody really looked at the problem with the correct technology up until that point. And it wasn't until J.J. Thompson, uh, right around 1900, 1897, he discovered the first atomic particle, subatomic particle, and that was the electron. And so we might, you might know that atoms are made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Right? And electrons are the smallest. They also have a negative charge. And because they're charged, it's really not surprising that they were the, the first particle found. Right? And how J.J. Thompson did this was he used a beam from a cathode ray tube. And so a cathode ray tube is shown here. You have an evacuated glass tube, uh, anode and a cathode that you apply a current through. And what you'll get is an ejection of an electron, what we know today as an electron, what they just thought of were cathode rays back back then and they would go and you could make the end of the glass tube have a phosphorescent coating and so every time one of these beams hit it you would see a, a bright spot and when you did that in a magnetic field you saw that the beam was deflected and they did that same sort of experiment in an electrical field and they also saw this beam was being deflected and it would deflect towards the positive plate. So that must mean that the whatever particle was in that ray was a negatively charged particle. And also doing these experiments, J.J. Thompson discovered that they contain a constant mass to charge ratio. That didn't change. And for this work, he was awarded the 1906 Nobel Prize. Here's just a, another explanation of this experiment. Right, you have a, a cathode and anode. It's shooting these beams that we now know are electrons. Right? The ray bends in a magnetic field, so we know it's consistent uh, of charged particles. The ray bends towards a positive plate, so we know these particles are negatively charged. And the ray is identical for any cathode, so you can change the substance that the cathode is made out of, but that doesn't change the ray. So we know that these particles are found in all of uh, all matter. And just as an aside, a cathode ray tube, that's exactly what an, an old TV, an old tube TV uh, is made out of. 
a little bit more sophisticated because they had uh, especially colored TVs. Um, each pixel had a, a different color that it could, could light up, right? But that's essentially what a TV is doing. You're, you're bending electrons to strike a, a phosphorescent plate in a, in a pattern. Another experiment that was important was that of Robert Millikan, and this was in 1909. And what he did, it, you're not going to need to know the details of this experiment, very sort of more complex experiment. But again, this is in 1909, right? So what he's doing with this, this whole experiment is trying to, to measure the, the charge of an electron and therefore the mass. And so these are the, the numbers that we know today as the charge of an electron and the mass of an electron. You don't need to memorize those. Right? So what Millikan was able to deduce was the charge of an electron by that experiment, the oil drop experiment. The mass to charge ratio was already determined by J.J. Thompson. So if you, you multiply mass divided by charge by charge, you get mass is what you're left with. And that's what Millikan did. And he did this in 1909 and measured the mass of an electron um, to a great deal of accuracy, which is, which is really remarkable. Right. And so J.J. Thompson, once he discovered the electron, came up with his model of what the atom looked like. And the other we sometimes refer to as the Thompson model, other times the plum pudding model. And what he thought was that electrons are distributed equally, uh, sort of diffusely throughout, excuse me, not diffusely. Electrons were distributed throughout a diffuse, positively charged sphere. So the electrons are the negative charged particles and in this atom, they're sort of distributive like plums in plum pudding through what he referred to as a diffuse positive charge. So this whole orange area would be the positive charge. Right. Well, to test this theory, um, a man named Rutherford was, was the person that actually wanted to test this theory but to do that, some other technological advances uh, needed to be uh, invented. And one of those was radioactivity. Uh, Henry Becquerel first discovered radioactive emissions. That was in 1896. He was actually the first winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903 for this observation. And what he did was he discovered that there was some materials that produced invisible radiation consisting of charged particles, right? what we refer to as radioactivity today. And the particles that he discovered, uh, beta particles and alpha particles. So what a beta particle is, it's a basically just a high energy electron, a free electron um, flowing around. Uh, alpha particles and that's this, the Greek symbol of alpha. What they are, they have a, a plus two charge, so they're positively charged. Uh, beta particles are negatively charged. And they have the same mass as a helium nucleus. Really what an alpha particle is, it's two protons and two neutrons stuck together. It's identical to a helium nucleus. Right? It just doesn't have electrons, that's why it's not the element helium. So this, this man, Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, came along and he wanted to test J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom and he used alpha particles. And how he did this is he had a thin piece of gold foil and he shot alpha particles into it. And J.J. Thompson's theory predicted that the alpha particles would basically travel straight through the foil um, most of the time, and sometimes they would kind of come into contact close to an electron, 
and there'd be a very little slight deflection. Right. The results were a little bit different, right? and we'll see in the next couple of slides what the results were. Really, they indicated the presence of a dense particle within the atom that would be known as the nucleus. And for this, Rutherford uh, won the 1908 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Right, so this is what the what we were expecting, what Rutherford was expecting, if J.J. Thompson's model held true. Right, so most of these alpha particles would go straight through, but some would come into close proximity to an electron. Remember, an alpha particle is positively charged, electrons negatively charged, so there'd be a slight deflection to it. Right. That, the results of the experiment were actually pretty close to what they were expecting, except they, would, they actually saw some really wide deflections, almost straight back to where the alpha particles were coming from. And the only explanation that they could come up with for that is that there's actually uh, something in the center of an atom that's very, very dense and has all the positive charge in it. And that's what they refer to as the nucleus. Here's another way to, to, sh to show this experiment. Um, this is from your book. Right? So here's a beam of alpha particles going through the gold foil. They set up the detector right, all the way around it pretty much. And that was, that was really key to this, this discovery. If they would have just been looking straight ahead, they would have seen sort of what they were expecting no deflection and then maybe a slight slight sometimes there were slight deflections but they did the negative what they thought was going to be a negative control and they put the detector all the way around the gold foil and because they did that they were able to to see these major deflections right and that's what gave them this model the nuclear model of the atom right the only way they could explain these major deflections is if the positive charge was very dense and concentrated at the center of the atom. And that's where we come to the atomic theory we have today, the nuclear atom. Right? And the nucleus, it contains all of the positive charge and nearly all the mass of an atom. It's about one ten thousandth the size of the atom, so if you want to make that analogy on something you can understand, think about a basketball arena. And if that basketball arena represented the size of an atom, the nucleus would be about the size of a basketball in the center of that arena, right? So the nucleus is much, much smaller than the, than the atom, right? And you probably already know this, but the nucleus contains two particles. One's a positively charged particle, we call that a proton. The other's a neutrally charged particle, and that's the neutron. So that gives us all three subatomic particles that we're gonna be talking about in this class. And if you know, a little bit about physics, you know that these subatomic particles are actually made up of smaller subatomic particles, but in chemistry we don't really concern ourselves with that. Okay, so we have the proton, its symbol is a little p with a subscript plus sign. Its relative charge is a plus one. Absolute charge, you can see here, you don't have to memorize that, of course. The mass unit we give it an atomic mass unit of approximately one. If you want to know what that is in, in an absolute value in grams, that's there. Neutron is very similar. Uh, it has a, a very similar atomic mass as the, the proton, um, very similar absolute mass, but it doesn't have a charge. It's, it's neutral, as the name suggests and its symbol would be an N with a superscript zero. Uh, the, the 
other particle, the first particle discovered, was the electron, and its symbol is a little e with a superscript negative sign. It has a negative one charge, and it's Sorry, don't know what happened there. But its mass is much, much smaller. Um, something like 0.05% of the proton or the neutron, right? So all the, the mass of an atom essentially is in the nucleus. Electrons really aren't, aren't very massive, right? Okay, so how we display information um, about elements in the, in the periodic table and the number of protons and neutrons they have, uh, a key for that is shown here, right? So this is sort of just a generic element that we'll call X. That's what's referred to as the atomic symbol. That's what you see in the periodic table. And then sometimes you'll have periodic tables that show you these other descriptors. Uh, if you have a, to the left of the atomic symbol, a superscript, that's what we refer to as A, or the mass number. What the mass number is, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, right? That tells you the, the atomic mass. And if you have a subscript on, on the left side of the atomic symbol, that's what we refer to as, as Z or the atomic number. That's the number of protons. Right? So every element has a different atomic number. The number of protons tells you what element um, you have. Right. So X is the atomic symbol. Z is the atomic number, that's the number of protons, different for every element. A is the mass number, which you can find out by multiplying, excuse me, adding the number of protons, the atomic number plus the number of neutrons. So if we look at some examples, uh, carbon 12, it's mass number is 12, its atomic number is 6, atomic number is 6, so 12 minus 6 would be 6 neutrons, so there's 6 protons, 6 neutrons give, gives us a mass number of 12. Oxygen has 8 protons, and it has a mass number of 16. So 16 minus 8, if we take the mass number minus 8 protons, that gives us 8 neutrons. Right? And because these are electrically neutral atoms, the number of electrons has to equal the number of protons. That's not always the case. We're going to talk about ions in this class, positively charged ions. will have less electrons than protons negatively charged ions will have more electrons than protons. Okay. The other term we need to understand is isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of an element with the same number of protons but they have a different number of neutrons. Right. So isotopes have the same atomic number but a different mass number because of that. And the really the classic example of isotopes. Uh, carbon is, is, a, is a good one to use, but also uranium, right? U uranium-235 and uranium-238 um, are the naturally occurring isotopes of uranium. They both have 92 protons, but uranium-235 has three fewer neutrons, 143 instead of 146. So let's try a practice problem. Determine the number of subatomic particles in the isotopes of an element. Carbon has three naturally occurring isotopes, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. 
determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in each carbon isotope. Okay. Okay, so we can, uh, if we look, we're given the A value for each. Right, so carbon 12, and we can write the Z value because we know it's carbon. It, carbon has an atomic number of six, so it always has six protons. If you're carbon, you have six protons. That's how we define what an element is, is the number of protons. Right. And so we have the mass numbers of 12, 13, and 14, and we have six protons. So the easiest, if we're trying to answer this question, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right. The easiest thing would be how many protons do, do these have? Well, they all have six, right? That's this this z value so all of them have six protons right second easiest thing to answer would be electrons right these are all neutral so the number of electrons has to equal the number of protons so the only thing we need to do any math for is the number of neutrons Right, so the number of neutrons in carbon-12 would be the mass number, 12, minus the atomic number, 6. That gives us 6. And if we do the same calculation with carbon-13, we have one more neutron, 7. That's why the mass number is one higher than carbon-12, because we have one extra neutron. Right? These are isotopes. And carbon-14 would have eight neutrons. Okay. So one way uh, you can look at this, this sort of uh, different isotopes is by uh, mass um, spectrometry. And this is just for your information. You, we're not going to be tested over this, so I'm just going to try to go over it very briefly. You can use a high-energy source of an electrons to kick an electron off of something, right? So in this case, it's neon, neon 20, right? If we kick an electron off of neon 20, we get neon 20 plus, right? There's 10 protons, but only nine electrons. So it has a positive charge. Right? If you send that a beam of, of neon 20 plus through a, um, a magnet, and then you have a detector at a certain length, Right? Based on the deflection, you can get different uh, charge to mass ratios and you can separate those out. Right? So that's, that's really the, the, the basis for mass spectrometry. And you can do that with, with atoms, with individual atoms, or you can do that with, with molecules, much larger molecules such as proteins. Right? But that's really um, beyond the scope of our class. Okay, let's try a calculation, calculating the atomic mass of an element. So for chlorine, it has an atomic number of 17. So it has 17 protons. It has two naturally occurring isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So the A value, the mass number, can be 35 or it can be 37. So from the mass data that's provided, calculate the atomic mass of chlorine. So in the periodic table, if you look up, up chlorine, the atomic mass of chlorine, what you'll see is that it's not listed as 35 or 37. It's sort of an average. And this is how... Uh, atomic masses are calculated for elements that have more than one isotope. Okay, so if we look at how, how do we solve this? Well, it's really just a weighted average. So for, for chlorine 35, 
the mass unit would be 34.969. And we multiply that by the fraction, the abundance, so 0.7578. And then we add that to the, the mass of chlorine 37, 36.996, times its natural abundance. So that'd be 0.2422, that'd be 24.22%. Right? When we do this, the math, what we get is 35.452. Right. That would be the average atomic mass of chlorine based on its two isotopes. Right. And if you look at the periodic table, we see that basically that's, that's the number that is given for the, the mass number of chlorine. And again, that's an average. When you see numbers like that with, you know, decimal point, not whole numbers, really that's it because it's an average of multiple isotopes. Okay, the last section we'll talk about in chapter two, 2.6, and elements in the first look at the periodic table. We're going to be covering this much more detail in chapter eight, so we're going to go a little bit quickly over this, but. Um, don't worry, we're going to be covering this again. Okay, so this is the periodic table. What you'll notice about this is that you see different colors, right? So, excuse me, laser pointer. So the yellow color represents non-metals. This darker blue color represents metals, what they call main group metals. This sort of a a teal blue color is what we refer to as transition metals, right? And then you have the inner transition as, as well, but we really won't be covering these elements in this class, right? So you'll notice that metals are on the left side of the periodic table, non-metals are on the right. And then you have this sort of a ladder type thing that's the transition between metals and non-metals. And then you have some green ones that we refer to as metalloids because they, they have both metal and non-metal properties. Uh, and silicon is a very uh, classic example of a metalloid. Right. Here's just a, just a figure showing that same thing. In, in the difference between non-metals, how non-metals look, and how metals look, it, it's very striking. It's something that you can you probably have experience with in, in everyday life, right? Okay. So let's use what we learned, um, atomic numbers, Z values. Use these Z values to look up in the periodic table um, and tell what element it is, give it symbol, and group and period numbers, right? So if we first look at uh, Z equals 26, so let's go back to our periodic table. 26 is right here. And that symbol is Fe. So that's iron. Right? And it's in what we refer to as group 8B. So I should mention now that when we say group, we're talking about columns. Group or family means columns. Period means row. All right? So that's just a a fancy saying group is just a fancy way of saying column, right? And so this used to be referred to as 8B. The other way, the more common way now to call this is just by the number of column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this would be column eight. Okay, so for iron, Z equals 26. Its symbol is Fe. It is in group 8B or 8. Okay. 
and what period is it? That's the row. If you look back on that periodic table, you'd see that it is in period four, the fourth row. What type of element is this? It's referred to as a transition metal. Okay, so if you want to look at these other two, try to try to um, determine the answers for those. Um, pause it, and then I will just give you the answers for those. So for B, Z equals 9, that's fluorine, or F. It's in what we call group 7A. I guess that's a capital A, huh? 7A, right? We also call these halogens. The other group number that you, you'll see is 17, right? That's the newer way of, of writing it. What period is it? It's period two, row two. And what is it classified as? Metal, non-metal, metalloid. It's actually a non-metal because it's all the way to the right, whoops, to the right of the periodic table. Right. Finally, C, uh, atomic number 37. That is rubidium. And I don't have its symbol. Let's look back. 37 RB. Rubidium. It is in column one, so that would, what would we refer to as group 1A, or just simply group one. It's in the fifth row, so that is period five. And it is, it's on the left side of the periodic table, so it's a metal, but it's specifically a, um, what we refer to as a main group metal. So main group metals are those that aren't in the transition metals. And in chapter eight, we'll, you'll really see what the difference between a transition metal and a main group metal is. Okay. The last thing we'll, we'll discuss is there's some relationship between the ions that are commonly formed by an element and the nearest noble gas. So this picture just tries to show you how a, a periodic table can be folded back on, its, on itself. Let me take my pen off and turn it to laser pointer. So this would be the, the group 8A or 18. That is the noble gas column. If we fold back group 1, so it's next to that, and look at these elements in some common ions they form. Remember an ion is going to be a positive or a negatively charged form of an element. It's either gaining an electron or losing an electron. Well elements gain or lose electrons to try to look as close to a noble gas electron configuration as they can. So we'll, we'll discuss that and what that means in chapter 8. But what you can think of is the number of negative charges or positive charge for an element, it's going to be how many rows away from noble gas row um, that, it, that it's sitting. So metals will have positive charges, right? So if we fold the periodic table back on itself, this first row, excuse me, first column of metals is going to, they're going to have plus one charges. Uh, group 2A is going to have plus 2 charges, and, and so forth. And this only works for main group metals, not transition metals. For nonmetals, if we look to the left of the noble gases, the halogens, right, they're one, one column away from noble gases, they're going to have negative charges, negative 1 charge. If we look at Group 6A, they're two columns away from noble gas, so they'll have negative two charges, uh, and so forth. All right? And that's one way you, you can know what charge an ion is going to have just based on its location in the periodic table.
right? So let's try a quick practice question, right? Predict the, the monatomic ions formed by each of the following elements. So iodine, iodine is a halogen. So it's to the left, it's a non-metal. So it's gonna have a negative charge. Remember, non-metals have negative charges, metals have positive charges. So iodine is one column away from noble gases, so it's gonna have, and it's a non-metal, so it's gonna have a negative one charge. Calcium, calcium is a metal, so it's gonna have a positive charge, but it's two columns away from noble gases, so it's gonna have a plus two charge. Uh, and finally, aluminum. Aluminum's a little bit tricky. Right? Aluminum is a metal, but it's right at that transition of metals and nonmetals. Let's look back at the periodic table. Right, so here's aluminum. So basically, aluminum, if you don't remember that it's a metal and it's going to lose electrons, um, it can have a we can just think of it as having a choice. Is it, is it going to gain five electrons to look like argon? Or is it gonna lose three electrons to look like neon? Well, it's much easier to lose three electrons than gain five. It's why it's considered a metal, right? So it's actually gonna lose three electrons and its electron configuration will, will be the same as neon. Right. But again, we'll talk about electron configurations in chapter 8. But for now, we can just say that it's three columns from a noble gas, its closest noble gas, so that's going to be a plus three charge. Okay, with that, um, that's the end of the first lecture, and we'll see you in class. If you have any questions, um, it's good to write them down and ask me at the beginning of class, um, and we can help discuss that.